So in early June of 2018, almost 30 movement leaders, activists, organizers, scholars came together to debate and think through some of the most critical questions as it relates to racial capitalism. Our goals, why we're here, right, is to share a working definition of racial capitalism. We're going to explore interpretations of the origin story of racial capitalism, study the timeline and evolution of racial capitalism, discuss and debate the current state of racial capitalism. In the majority, one of the things that we said we wanted to do is to really deepen our understanding of issues. And so this is one of the ways we're doing that through the think tank. The term racial capitalism really signals very basically that race and racial categories and capitalism are co-constitutive. And race and gender, they're not accidental features of the global capitalist order. Race isn't simply an identity, but it's a structure of power. And the secret to capitalism survival uh, isn't, you know, simply dispossession and violence and what we call so-called primitive accumulation, which is ongoing, but the secret is racism's ability and the patriarchal state's ability to capture the section of a semi-exploited working class. To me, it's an intervention by starting the first think tank dealing with racial capitalism is saying capitalism and racism and the racialization and national oppression are intricately linked at this period in history. The first European uh, working class that is dispossessed from the land, dispossessed from means of production, were not just class subjects, but racial subjects. They weren't Africans, but they were other racialized subjects. They were Irish as a racialized subject. There were Jews, they were Roma, there were gypsies, there were Slavs, they were marked as racialized subjects. And so when we make this distinction between Europe and the rest, we actually don't end up seeing how processes of invasion, settlement, expropriation, and racial hierarchy were already in practice in Europe. Like the idea that um, Europe was already racialized even before capitalism and that racialization is how um, capitalism was developed, was something that, although I had an awareness of it, I don't think I really understood how much it was at the root of uh, it. You actually put into words something that has been in the back of my mind and bothering me. You said racial capitalism can become a substitute for talking about capitalism itself. And can you elaborate on that? Right. So I've been having these debates and struggles with people who basically like, I, I don't need to read Marx. All that, all that scholarship is just not worth reading because ultimately, I want, I'm not interested in capitalism, I'm interested in racial capitalism. And to me, those things are inseparable. Uh, even if we disagree with what, say, Marx or Lenin or Rosa Luxemburg or any of those people write, and even if we don't read Paul Sweezy or Paul Baran or any of those folks, um, we do have to understand, I think, the way capitalism works as a global system. It's critical for us to understand what is the socioeconomic system that we're living under? What's the socioeconomic system that is um, creating all these different forces that are really just um, manifesting violence on our communities and really creating harm, again, not just on our people, but also on the planet. I really do think the 21st century has created new challenges for how capital is functioning and how we have to function in opposition to it. Unlike a period in time where if you were a blacksmith or a carpenter, you would have your wood, you would have your workshop, you would make your stuff, and you might sell it, right, if you made more than you needed. Under capitalism, the means of production are owned by the capital, so they own the stuff. And then they purchase your labor in a wage uh, labor system. And the importance of having Barbara, Leaf, Pramila, having Robin Kelly, like the ability to have folks who study this right alongside um, theorist uh, organizers. So to look at a historical view, not to be ahistorical, I think is critical to the uh, success of this thing tanking future. What, what are we going to think right? about that as a definition? How can it be honed and what's missing? The oppression of whole nations and peoples as a, a stage of capitalism. So the way that capitalism is, is, in its totality, disrupts and eliminates and supplants the ways people were already navigating. So the removing of, the, of sacredness, the removing of even family, the removal of community, um, the, the removal of autonomy, mm -hmm. of bodily integrity. 
folks that were part of the majority just realized that as we were developing strategy together and trying to be in shared practice together, that we needed to create a space where we're debating ideas and we're also understanding sort of like where do we agree and where do we not where do we not agree? And so we wanted to create what we call a freedom think and action tank. In my understanding, if the state is like about maintaining racial capitalism, then the state, the concessions the state makes are really for white people. When I'm talking about nation state, what I'm talking about is the modern nation state that emerged between the 17th and the 19th century. Prior to that, there were other governing structures, but the nation state is a particular formation, state formation that is tied to an understanding of nationalism. And so that's why racial capitalism becomes so important in thinking about the nation state. It's not just a state formation, but it's a national state formation. This country, the United States, was indigenous land. And so the creation of this as a white nation is clearly something that was created by those people who had power at that particular time. I want to hear from the folks who are thinking about um, the stateless as a strategy. About. To me, the strongest piece that comes out of this is taking the time to actually theorize so that it can influence our practice, so that we can start thinking about strategies. So I talked about an assessment. It's looking at, thinking about, you know, what are the sets of contradictions? Not that contradictions are negative, but that contradictions are relational and what is, so that we begin to know where the shifts need to happen and how we think about the role of the state in our contestation. It sounds like there was actually very little contradiction in the room. That racism and that racialization and capitalism are intrinsically connected. Mm -hmm. We can understand the history that violence and that the, the role that the nation state has played and that no other governing formation has played in the same way that the nation state has with capitalism and the destruction of the earth and the subjugation of like millions and millions of people, but you're still pro-state. I don't understand. I think oftentimes in movement spaces, we're so eager um, to, to move strategy together. And also like we're under so much pressure and so much urgency to like protect our communities. And so sometimes there's not a lot of desire to slow down and really surface like where do we disagree and, and what does that mean for the work that we're doing together? So it's really sometimes not about sort of the actual disagreements, but how do we hold it together? You know, I think we have to work within the state, get reforms and concessions out of it. I think we have to work against it to expose it. I think we have to work outside of it to create alternatives. All those things have to happen at the same time. To me, like Barbara, you talked about working within, it can ameliorate, but it also co-ops. If we're not going in to destroy, that that's really different. And to me, destroy means like shift where the locus of power is held. It's to shift the fundamental nature of what the structure looks like. If you don't have enough trust to debate, then you can't really organize because um, the idea can't just be your idea. It has to be a collective and shared understanding. It doesn't matter what I, I mean, it matters what I personally think, but if I'm the only one that thinks it, that's a bit insubstantial uh, to what we gotta do. If I'm the only one who thinks this is an issue and nobody else does, then we can't collectively I work against the a issue. A lot of what Barb shared is saying, like, what the role of the state is. Right. So if we know that the state throughout crumbs in order to protect capitalism because it because of uh, people's rebelling against it, then to me, I don't then understand the state outside of its capitalism. Never. Right. Welfare state. And, you know, there's all this stuff about the New Deal, you know, like the New Deal saved capitalism from possible revolution. Right? Because mm -hmm. people were in the streets around evictions and people were hungry and there were mass demonstrations. The liberal could look at it and see it as a benevolent gesture on the part of the state. But in fact, if you look at it dialectically, the purpose of that intervention was a larger project of restabilizing capitalism. You know, the only way we build power and actually win is to build movements that are not just rooted in a particular country, but that are tied up in movements around the world. And so if we're going to resist together, we actually have to understand how um, different movements, different communities are under attack. This new form of capitalism or this emerging form of capitalism has also produced a new racial project. You now have a real retrenchment and a rejection of liberal multiculturalism and a return to explicit white supremacy. The war on drugs criminalize 
a racialized people transnationally, capitalism having to find spaces. And the spaces are very often those resources and spaces owned by racialized people. Is this in fact a new moment? Is it just an acceleration of stuff that's been going on? Or is it a rupture? Is it a breaking point? A breaking point at which capitalism can no longer coexist with liberal democracy. Uh, the two ways I see that it can go is further toward fascism. I think that the other way is that there's a lot of mobilization. This is for the majority. Lots of different organizations with uneven development across the movement, and we're trying to bring up the floor um, and ground it in real rigor. This has to be led by people of color, because if the resistance is not led by people of color, they will not deal with white supremacy. And if they don't deal with white supremacy, is not gonna work.